Welcome to the second episode on the Buddhist teachings about the six realms that we can take rebirth into. If you missed the first part and you're not familiar with these teachings, please listen to that first. In this episode, we're going to talk about taking these rebirths metaphorically and how contemplating these different kinds of births can benefit us in this lifetime. Welcome to Letting Grow, the podcast about one of the spiritual journey's most difficult and courageous moments, letting go of who we think we should be so we can grow into who we most deeply are. I'm your host, Claire Villarreal, and I appreciate your joining me today. Now that we've talked about the six realms of rebirth, literally, let's go back and think through them metaphorically too. And I think for a lot of modern people, it's actually maybe more helpful to think first, at least, of these realms of rebirth in terms of their metaphorical aspects or their metaphorical truths instead of trying to think of them literally. Because once you can kind of see this at play in your own life, it makes it easier to, you know, accept the rest of the wisdom behind the teachings. Or maybe you just don't believe in literal rebirth, and that's fine too, because it's a set of teachings that can really help us notice our own actions and notice when we're falling into kind of a dream state, you know, like really seeing life through a a super strong lens. So that's kind of how I want to talk about these um, metaphorical understandings of rebirth is they're like lenses that we don't realize we're wearing as we look out at the world. So to start with the lowest of the six realms, the hell realms, we can think about the lens that we're wearing when we fall into that kind of a state in terms of hatred. And often in the Buddhist tradition, people talk about anger. They talk about, you know, hatred. Those terms are sometimes even used like interchangeably. But really what we're talking about when we talk about the hell realms in a metaphorical sense is not like a healthy anger that'll help you set boundaries or alert you to when something is just not right and you need to fight to make things different. We're talking here about the intent to harm and maybe even enjoy harming. So this is not just being able to stand up for ourselves. This is not only do I dislike what that person is doing, but I want to be the one to really make them pay for it. So when we talk about the hell realms in that sense, these descriptions of the cold hells are kind of like a a cold anger. You know, when you hold it inside and you think like, okay, I can't get this person now, but I'm going to hang on to this. And when I can use whatever I have against them, really to best effect, I'm going to get them back. So resentment, stuff sometimes we don't even notice we're carrying with us, but it kind of gets buried deep down in there. And there's a part of us that is just waiting for our moment to take revenge. And when we're in that state of mind, that's like a cold hell. You know, there's something within us that's just freezing the life out of us. And part of what I think is useful about having this description of this as a state of rebirth is that if you notice yourself falling into it, it's just one of the ways that our emotional energy manifests itself. We're not bad people. Like a hell being is not necessarily a bad being. There's someone who has taken some bad actions, they're paying for it, and sooner or later, they're going to be reborn into some other state of existence. So it's the same thing, you know, when we find ourselves in this like really intensely negative and hurtful state of mind, it's not permanent. We're not bad people for having these thoughts or whatever. Our job in that state is to recognize it, not keep feeding that karmic momentum, so to speak, and then, and then go on to something else. And it's the same thing with the hot hells. So with these, we might be more actively, you know, taking action on our hurtful intentions. I think this is a lot easier with something like verbal actions or even mental actions. It's, it's easy to just fall down that rabbit hole of, internally despising someone else or like dwelling on, oh, what should happen to this politician or whoever that we don't like? 
it's it's easy to fall into that. And honestly, I think there's a lot of media like TV and movies and stuff like that where the entertainment is falling into those states, you know, vicariously experiencing someone else's hot anger or their wish to harm other people. And, you know, sometimes there are bad guys that are just so bad that we feel like, oh, well, they deserve it. And, and it feels good somehow to want them to be hurt. And, you know, if that's your thing, it's your thing. But for me, it just feels kind of icky to have entertainment based on this. So I think, you know, when we're taking these mental actions on our own, or even when we're watching or listening to something or reading a book, we can just notice, like, when are we falling into that kind of state? Like, is that the kind of state that we really want to feed with our emotional energy? So that's the hell realms. They're just situations in which we feed the intention to harm others. We feed that that sense that we'll gain power or strength or something by being able to strike back at somebody. So when we find ourselves falling into those states, the traditional remedy is, not surprisingly, loving kindness and compassion. There, there are actual remedies that we can take when we notice that we're falling into these states. Even with self-hatred, we can flip around and try and use self-compassion. You know, if we're beating ourselves up about something that we did and we really feel like we deserve some beating up and we're going to do that to ourselves and sort of enjoy it. If we can, if we can recognize the painful element in that state of mind or in the thing that happened and offer ourselves some compassion instead of judgment and harshness can be a tremendous way of changing our relationship with ourselves. Same thing when we find ourselves feeling these kinds of really virulent hatred toward other people, can we recognize the things that are under their behavior? Maybe fear or a sense of inadequacy. Probably there's a lot of shame. Brene Brown's work, like uh, The Gifts of Imperfection and other books, is really great for understanding shame and the ways it can drive us to some really obnoxious behaviors. So, the, the the opportunity to wake up out of that state is by recognizing we're in it, first of all, and then cultivating some loving kindness and some compassion toward ourselves or others and just flipping it around, taking back control of our mind. The next realm to talk about in our journey through the metaphorical six realms of existence is the hungry ghosts. And as with the literal description of the hungry ghosts, the metaphorical description, the emotional description of this realm is when we feel like we can't even get our basic needs needs met. We have such a fear of just not having enough. And this is sort of similar to the demigods. They're also always feeling not enough, but I think it's different because with the demigods, they're looking at the people who are at the peak of existence. And they want that. With a hungry ghost, they can't even get food and drink. So with the demigods, your life actually is very good. If you could just stop and appreciate it, you would have everything you need. With the, with the hungry ghost, there's a real sense that we can't even get the bare necessities. And that leads to this real behavior of trying to grab onto, trying to cling to, trying to keep everything we possibly can for ourselves because we're just concerned we're not going to survive without it. I think, honestly, this kind of mental state drives a lot of hoarding behaviors, drives people to keep even things that are not feeding us at all. So when I think about like Marie Kondo, for instance, and her emphasis on giving up everything that doesn't bring us joy, I feel like that's a real counter to this state of mind of I have to have everything I can get. There's not going to be enough. I'm not going to survive. I have to grab. I have to cling on to everything I possibly can. So maybe this is a little new and very modern, but I think Marie Kondo's work can be a great antidote to that internal hungry ghost feeling. But definitely the traditional antidote to this state was generosity. So you're feeling like, I don't even have enough for myself. I won't survive, blah, blah, blah. Even making a small mental offering, even imagining making some kind of offering, being in a position to make an offering of something, of time, of money, of food, of material goods, or whatever it may be, it can really help to transform 
that state and to help get us out of it. It's like each of these is something we fall into. We get stuck in it. So when that hungry ghost lens kind of comes over our eyes, if we can notice it and then apply that antidote of making an offering, or if you want to, if you want to use Marie Kondo's methods of just releasing the stuff in our lives, it doesn't really suit us. It's not bringing us the sort of emotional comfort and support that we think it's going to. Just noticing and taking action that is going to get us out of that state is really powerful. The next in the six realms of existence is animals. So if we're like metaphorically getting reborn into an animal state, it's like this lens of just dullness and stupidity has come over us. And and what this means is not like we're intellectually unintelligent. We could be brilliant, but if we're only chasing after the most basic physical comforts and pleasures, we're only thinking about this moment, that's really when we've fallen into an animal-like state. And again, just noticing it is already the first part of getting ourselves out of that kind of state. So if you find that we're just interested in food or sex or sleeping or whatever it is, If we could start even thinking about the future, if we could question, yeah, but what's the ultimate benefit of this? Just something to bring in our mind's critical skills, to bring in the rest of what we know and understand about life, we're starting to kind of wake ourselves up out of that dull, sluggish, animal-like state. Hi, friends. Want to join the Letting Grow tribe? I'll be starting a bi-weekly newsletter in early 2021 with links to articles, YouTube videos, other podcasts, and basically the best of the rebirth content I've come across lately. Some examples of the kinds of things I want to share with you include a snap judgment story about a bull who seemed to be the reincarnation of another bull, a viral article about the creepy things kids say, but some of them 100% seem to refer to previous lives and some excerpts from the book I'm writing now about the lessons Tibetan Buddhist teachings on life and death offer to those of us going through transitions. Spoiler alert, that's all of us. Best of all, if you're subscribed, you'll get links to join free live video calls with me and other subscribers every couple of months. So pause this episode now, find the newsletter sign-up link in the show notes, and join your tribe. So next up is the human realm, and we are talking metaphorically now about these realms, but the humans are the one realm that we are literally living out, so I don't think we need to talk about this one. So let's just move on to the demigods. So if we've fallen into a demigod state of mind, if we've taken like a temporary rebirth into a demigod realm, then we are being driven by jealousy. And this is different from that hungry ghost sense of not enough, not enough, not enough, because our survival is not really on the line. When we have that jealousy, we're driven by looking at someone else that we're so close to, but we're not quite there. And to me, it's a really poignant description because I think a lot of us, I definitely myself, you know, I've had so many times in my life where I feel like if I could accomplish this one thing, I would arrive. Or if we see someone who gets the job we want, or they seem to have the life we want, or whatever it is, it's easy from the outside to think, why do they have that? I should have that. I've put in the work. I'm whatever, more X than they are. Um, better at my job, I'm smarter, I've worked at it longer, whatever, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that sort of core emotional truth of looking at what someone else has and thinking, that should be mine, that should be me, I should be in that place. So one story that stands out to me when it comes to the demigods is I have a friend who went to a really exclusive prep school in Houston. So a lot of wealthy families go there. And this person when they were growing up in the school, they're only surrounded by like the wealthiest people in Houston. And incidentally, Houston has a lot of people with a lot of oil money. So like, we're not talking about small amounts of money. We're talking probably billionaires. And this friend of mine, you know, their family was legitimately wealthy, but they weren't as wealthy as some of these other families. And so this person kind of felt growing up as though they were the poor kid because their family didn't have a private jet. 
And to me, that kind of nails like the emotional truth of the demigod state. You have all this wealth and power and, you know, whatever it is. But maybe you're a millionaire and you're looking at billionaires. So what really gets me about this description with the demigods is that if we could just relax into what we already have, that would solve this problem. It's the longing for the next thing, you know, the longing for being number one instead of number two that really gets us in trouble. So the antidote to this state is rejoicing in other people's good fortune. (laughs) And this is one of the four, they're called Brahma Viharas, like divine abidings, the four um, loving kindness meditations that are common to all forms of Buddhism. It's it's joy, but it's specifically sympathetic joy, joy in others' good fortune. And we might start by cultivating this in a way that's easier. So like when we hear about, for instance, somebody who's made a contribution to a hospital or someone who has like written this amazing book and we love reading it, that could be like a, an easy way to rejoice in someone else's good fortune. It can be harder if we're looking at someone in our own life or someone who's done the thing we want to do but can't, or we're trying to do that and it just hasn't worked for us yet. So we can start out with a smaller way to practice this rejoicing in someone else's good fortune, but it really comes in handy when it comes to times in life that we really get sucked into this demigod mood. And for me... I don't know that I feel this kind of jealousy like intensely and consciously all that often, but I think there have been times when I've been really driven by this sense of I'm kind of good enough, but not quite. So like when I was in grad school, for instance, working on my PhD, there was just this sense of, you know, once I get this degree, then I will have, I will have proven myself to myself. And the truth is there's just never a moment when you arrive. I haven't found a moment when I feel like I've arrived yet. And it's this state and maybe a subtle level that just keeps me from appreciating the places where I am as fully as I could. So this brings us to the God realm. And metaphorically speaking, the God realm is that is that lens through which life looks amazing. My life is great because I have it all figured out. And it's such a, it's such a seductive state because it's very complacent. You know, a lot of us have spent a lot of time sort of working toward the goals that we accomplish or working toward the comforts that we enjoy. And it can feel just very reasonable to think, yeah, I earned this. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to appreciate it. This is just how my life is going to be from now on. And just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with being in a great situation in life. The thing that the God realm teaching points out, though, is that when we take it for granted, when we feel a sense of entitlement, this is my life, when we also feel that maybe we've earned it and because we've earned it, we're never going to lose it, that's where we really get in trouble. Because the teaching of, of the God realm is that this comes about through causes and conditions. And those causes and conditions, they're always changing. So even though we may have this like wonderful, luxurious existence now, that doesn't mean we're going to keep it. It doesn't mean the stock market's not going to crash tomorrow. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have some incredible personal tragedy that that really throws a wrench in this perfect life that we've built for ourselves. So some examples of God realm beings, so to speak, might be like Hollywood stars or somebody who has just this incredibly glamorous life and they're this beautiful person, their partner's beautiful, their home is beautiful, they're making millions of dollars, blah, blah, blah. Like it just, they look like they have all the things that everybody is supposed to want in this lifetime. And I think we've seen enough suicides and tragedies in Hollywood to recognize that just having that lifestyle is actually not enough to make us happier, to insulate us against suffering. So when we find ourselves falling into that kind of state of like, this is amazing and it's never going to change, hopefully that itself can be a wake up call. Yes, sooner or later, this is going to come to an end. And we can think about what we can be doing now to really be still cultivating ourselves as people, to be thinking toward the future. And I don't want to say to not be satisfied with the present. Obviously, it's 
wonderful to be able to appreciate and recognize and be satisfied by what we have. But to think this is what I deserve and what I need and anything less than this is not going to make me happy. It really sets us up to be vulnerable to losing what we found, losing the happiness and the comfort that we found because it depended on external circumstances. So when we find ourselves feeling that way, hopefully we can recognize it as kind of a God realm feeling, wake up out of that, realize that at least part of the reason we're in this situation now is our previous actions and that nothing is guaranteed. We need to appreciate what we have, not take it for granted, and also not have a sense of pride that just, I know what I'm doing. I've reached the pinnacle of life and I'm never going to lose it. So I hope that quick tour through some of the metaphorical ways we can understand these teachings about the six realms is helpful in kind of taking them in emotionally and not just as like a literal description of what is waiting for us after this lifetime. So the last thing I want to talk about is the benefits of reflecting on these teachings. Basically, they're an important part of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and anything that survived for (laughs) hundreds or even (laughs) over a thousand years in a spiritual tradition probably has some benefits to offer. So what are those benefits? So first of all, if you take these teachings literally, I think one important benefit traditionally of the teachings is that they kind of help scare people straight. It's not that different from Christian teachings on hell and if you do this, you're going to go to hell and if you do that, you're going to go to hell and then they, you know, try and terrify you about what hell looks like. It's These teachings have definitely been used in that way in the Tibetan tradition for a long time. And I think for most of us as moderns, uh, especially those of us who maybe grew up in a tradition where we got that a lot as kids and it just doesn't work on us anymore, I don't think that's a super useful approach. But if it works for you, then that's great. The other thing is, if you take these teachings literally, then right now we're shaping our next lifetime. And this is a way more important benefit, I think, in the if you're taking these teachings literally than being scared straight, so to speak. Because karma creates our next lifetime, shapes our next lifetime, and because that karma is something we can influence now, but we can't influence it like at the time of death, now is the time to think about what's good about our lifetime. What do we want from our next lifetime? And like I mentioned earlier, the traditional teaching is that we want to be reborn as a human and not just any human. We want to be reborn as someone who has the opportunity to study spiritual teachings. So if we're living a life of poverty, we really have no chance to devote ourselves to spiritual teachings because we're going to spend all of our time just trying to survive. It's the same thing with war, other sorts of like really bad external circumstances we're going to be trying to survive. So making aspirations that we will, first of all, be human in our next lifetime. And then secondly, that we'll have the kinds of opportunities that we need to do real spiritual practice. That's considered really important in this tradition. I want to share a little thought that one of my friends had which is that there's often these uh, movies like Back to the Future where somebody goes back to the past and they change one little thing in the past and then it changes everything in their current, you know, existence. And my friend was like, why don't we ever talk about that? But in terms of this lifetime and creating our future, and it's true. That's definitely how the Buddhist tradition looks at it. Every little thing we do could have a big payoff in the future. So if we're you know, taking spiritual action in this lifetime, if we're practicing meditation or we're cultivating kindness and compassion, if we think about it just in terms of the benefits for this lifetime, there are benefits. But if we think about it also in terms of sort of investing in our future lifetime and really having that intention, you know, may I not just do this action now, may I cultivate the habit of doing this action so that in the future too, my future existence will have opportunities for me to do this. From a traditional point of view, it can really supercharge our practice in terms of the benefits that we get out of it because we are actively helping to shape our next lifetime. 
And just as a sort of side note on that topic, traditional Buddhist practice is different from, say, mindfulness or more of a secular Buddhist approach in that it's really not just oriented toward this lifetime. Although that's great, it's it's wonderful for this lifetime to, you know, reflect on topics and practice meditation, do all the things we may do as part of a spiritual path. But the thing that's different with traditional Buddhist practice is that with the aspirations and dedication prayers and just sort of parts of a traditional practice session, you're really trying to to cultivate a benefit that goes beyond just this lifetime. And speaking of this lifetime and the fact that it comes to an end, it can be really helpful to reflect on the death and rebirth process in a literal sense because it helps us to remember death. It helps us to remember that what is happening right now is not going to happen again. Even though we might believe in reincarnation in a literal way, this lifetime is the only time we're going to live it. Once it's over, this personality is done. And it's a real call to to be present, to experience and appreciate what we're doing now, but also not to just think, well, this is going to go on forever, indefinitely. Other people die, but I'm not going to die. Other people get old, I'm not going to get old. If we reflect on these topics and we reflect on what our literal next lifetime is going to be, we can't really ignore the fact that this lifetime does not last forever. And that's just beneficial for the way we live and what we prioritize and trying not to get to the end of our life and then look back and realize, what was I doing? Why was I chasing all these little things when I should have been you know, experiencing joy with people in my life that I love. Another benefit of reflecting on these teachings about the six realms of rebirth, if you take them literally, is that they can really help to cultivate compassion and gratitude. So first of all, in terms of gratitude, humans have this real tendency to compare upward. We're sort of in demigod mode all the time. We we look at what we have and we look at whoever's above us and we're much more likely to compare ourselves with the people above us than the people below us. And what these teachings do on hell beings and hungry ghosts and animals and all this kind of stuff is we we compare our current life to what it could be. (laughs) And it gives us an opportunity to be grateful, not to be, I don't know, getting smushed by molten like metal and whatever else happens in the hell realms. There's a lot of smushing and being chopped up and being burned. Uh, highly unfortunate. And in the cold realms, you you know, your body falls apart and splits and whatnot because you get so cold because you freeze. So uh, there's a lot of really unpleasant stuff that could be happening to us right now, but isn't. So it offers us an opportunity to not just reflect on our life and be grateful for it, but also to really think like, (laughs) I don't know what my next lifetime is going to be. I better use this one well, because I'm not guaranteed to have the same opportunities again in my next rebirth. So finally, let's circle back a bit to the metaphorical interpretation of this teaching on the six realms of rebirth and just reflect on the benefits of engaging with the teachings in that way too. So obviously, if we're familiar with these different realms of rebirth, so to speak, we're more likely to notice them when we fall into them in a given day. And we also know that there are antidotes. So when we notice that we're falling into one of them, we can apply the antidote and get out. (laughs) Or if we're thinking about it in terms of like a lens that comes down over our eyes and kind of colors the entire world around us, instead of just taking that coloring of the world as the way it is, we can have the opportunity to like lift that lens up to look a little bit more clearly at what is around us. Finally, I talked about the fact that from a traditional perspective, we're shaping our next lifetime now. But really, we're also shaping the rest of our lives now. (laughs) So even within this one lifetime, the things we're feeding, the habit patterns, the emotional patterns that we're feeding now are going to structure the rest of our lives. So even taking these teachings metaphorically gives us an opportunity to really be more intentional about what we're feeding, what thoughts we're feeding, what communication patterns we're feeding, the physical actions and the ways that we spend our time. Like, what are we feeding in those terms? Because the more we can be intentional about this lifetime, the better this lifetime is. And Whether you believe in literal rebirth or not, 
we're all going to go through changes and transformations in our lives. And the better we live now, the better our relationships are with other people now, the better our relationship with ourselves, then the the better those transitions will go, the more smoothly they'll go, and the better the outcomes once we go through them, you know, the better our relationships with other people and the better our sense of community. So this is a topic that a lot could be set on. And as I mentioned, uh, I recommend some reading in Words of My Perfect Teacher and Tantric Practice in Yingma. There will be links to those two books and, and to the chapters that you can check out for this topic. And I hope you'll explore these in your own life and really see what does it do for me when I reflect on these six realms of existence and when I open myself to the possibility that the way I see the world right now maybe isn't accurate, maybe it's actually through a lens of one of these forms of rebirth, so to speak. So thank you for listening. I hope you will take this out and experiment and see what happens and then write me. You'll find my email address in the show notes, and I would love to hear what happens for you. Thanks for coming along for today's exploration of the process of letting grow. If you found this episode helpful, please share it. And subscribe now wherever you listen to podcasts so you're always in the loop. For links to more content related to today's episode, please see the show notes. See you again next week.